Kira Tato, Kai Russell Death, Toko Anoa, Ika Matia, Kuaora, Awa Ahu. Thank you very much for that. Um, I must start this talk by actually apologising. Um, this is actually the worst time of year to actually ask a professor to come along and give a talk. We're just at the end of the first semester of teaching, and so at the moment I'm marking lots of assignments and tests and exams and discovering that at least 50% of the students in my classes weren't paying attention. <laughs> and so it can uh, demoralise one somewhat, that you put in all this hard effort to try and educate these young minds, but they are um, relentlessly trying to avoid that education. So um, when I did a bit of a run through with Fiona, my wife, she said that it was a little bit pessimistic. Um, I've improved things a little bit, but it's probably made it more pessimistic than less pessimistic. Um, and really, uh, following in line with that pessimism, I thought in the interest of time that really to summarise the, my question in the beginning of the talk, do we really care if our rivers die? I think uh, in general really, um, as far as I can see, most people don't really care. Um, I think there are maybe some individuals that really do, but in general, um, I think certainly at the national and the local level of government, that although there is lots of rhetoric around for issues in New Zealand, that really, in general, all we are doing is really recording the demise. So I've been doing research in freshwater ecology for 30 years. I've been going to lots and lots of meetings about the big issues we have in freshwater for 30 odd years. Uh, and almost every one of these meetings, everybody agrees that things are terrible. We really need to do something. We really need to stop having these meetings and get on and get, get stuck in and do something. And Really, that's been going on for 30 years, and in that time, um, I think things have only just got worse. So, it really does feel to me like we are really just recording the demise of water quality. And although you hear lots and lots of people talk about the bad situation that we are in, and that we really must do something, I think at the end of the day, there are very few people that are actually doing anything at all. My perspective is purely an ecological one, so um, I will briefly mention human health. Uh, if rivers are healthy for the animals that live in them, then they are usually healthy for us to go and swim and fish in them as well, but they don't necessarily directly correlated. And I certainly won't focus very much on economics, culture, or social perspectives. And in fact, uh, as the introduction suggested, what I'm really most passionate about are these little creepy crawly things. And I didn't start out as an advocate for fresh water or for fresh water management. I started out as an entomologist with an intense interest in <coughs> the little creepy crawly things. And I guess through time, being at Massey for lo so long, I have done a little bit of research dealing with freshwater fish, uh, supervised a few research theses on freshwater fish, but really my main area of passion and interest are the aquatic invertebrates. And although I premised this talk by saying that um, I'm a little bit negative, um, I think you can't help but be when you're a river ecologist. And certainly when you tr give these talks, it is really hard to sell what you're trying to say. Um, in New Zealand, we have the highest percentage of endangered freshwater fish in the world. We have some of the most polluted rivers in the Western world. We are giving away water um, from our national parks for free for bottling. There is no monitoring of any endangered freshwater invertebrates in New Zealand by anybody. Uh, nitrate levels are increasing in all of our waterways. And we have some of the highest levels of waterborne diseases in the world. Um, so, as you can see, it's quite hard to come up with anything positive to say. I think a lot of the problem really is that water quality in New Zealand does not look like this. I think if our rivers were polluted in this way, if we could see things in our rivers floating or if they were bright red or if there was lots of dead animals, I think the public outcry would be much greater than it is now. Unfortunately, this is what a polluted New Zealand river looks like. It's green and brown and most of us just seem to think that that's a natural situation for rivers in New Zealand. Unfortunately, it's not. But, as I said, if it was like this, everyone, I mean everyone, would be an uproar about it. And we are, have, in many ways, exactly the same issues of pollution. We don't have red rivers, we don't have radiation, we don't have heavy metals, we don't have rubbish in our rivers. But, from the perspective of the animals living in those waterways, for people wanting to go and enjoy those waterways, the effect is exactly the same. It just looks a lot less than the rubbish that I presented before. And consequently, I think far more people are willing to accept that that's just the way rivers are in New Zealand. 
I guess one of the biggest challenges I have with talking to people is that just like human health, you can't talk about one thing when you talk about the health of a river. So there's been a lot of publicity recently around bacteria, the E. coli liver levels in waterways. You go to the doctor, you don't expect the doctor to just take your temperature and send you on your way and say you're fine. You expect him to measure your blood pressure, maybe take a blood test, get you to breathe in and out, listen to your heart, etc, etc. In exactly the same way, the health of an ecosystem, a river, is exactly the same thing. There are lots of factors which contribute to the health of that ecosystem. There are the animals living in it, the plants, the invertebrates, the fish. There are the nutrients going into it, the sediment, the amount of oxygen. And it only takes one of those things to go wrong for that system to become unhealthy. Just like with our human health, if we have high blood pressure, that can make us sick, even though all of the other measures that we have are perfectly within the realms of what they should be. So I think it, it's very misleading that people talk about, well, the E. coli level is too high. Okay, what about all of the other things? You know, the um, arsenic levels are too high in that water. What about all of the other things? It only takes one little thing to go wrong, just like our health, and that whole system collapses. Is water quality declining in New Zealand? This is a map um, of the nitrate levels and waterways all around New Zealand. The red are the very high levels of nitrates in our waterways. Nitrates are just one of the, the toxins which are polluting our waterways. And you can see um, areas which are slightly redder than some of the other areas. So I've just highlighted those for you. Um, I'll leave it up to you to figure out what the main industry in those areas are. So Waikato, Taranaki, Manawatu, Canterbury and Southland. However, to me, and a lot of the debate is around, uh, is water quality getting worse? Is it declining? To me, it's not so much a question of whether it's getting worse or not. I mean, that is important when we put it in the context of whether or not all of the things that the government is doing to improve things are good. But really, to me, I think the issue is water quality in many, many New Zealand rivers is bad and not as good as we would like. And we shouldn't be worried about whether it's getting better or worse. We should be worrying about making it a lot better than it really is. <coughs> And although I suggested at the beginning that perhaps nobody really cares that much about rivers, um, there are certainly a lot of people that do. And more and more I think the public are getting a bit outraged that they can't go to their local stream and swim in it and enjoy it. Um, more and more people are starting to protest. Um, I'm not sure how many different protest movements there are around New Zealand about the management of our fresh waters. Uh, Choose Clean Waters is a, a young group of students, some from Massey, who have made quite a big flash on the scene over the last couple of years, but there are certainly lots of people out there that are, are doing a lot of good work for freshwater management. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to acknowledge Rosemary Miller, who's a, a local person from Whanganui. Rosemary's been a, a very quiet but strong advocate for freshwater management for as long as I have been working. She was one of my first students and she works in DOC, she's now leading their freshwater team. And as many of you will know, that actually try and work from within the organisation or from within the team to make a difference, you find it extremely hard to do. You have to struggle at it, but at the same time, people on the outside who are criticising what everyone is doing tend to um, put a lot of scorn towards you. So I think it's unfortunate that people like Rosemary don't get the credit that they're due, that some of my other students who are much more outspoken get a lot more credit, whereas Rosemary has tirelessly been working um, kind of behind the scenes within the constraints of DOC and actually in my opinion actually making quite a big difference so I'd just like to uh, acknowledge the hard work that she's been doing and I suspect it gets very little reward from anybody for what she's been doing. And of course there are lots of nice Twitter um, things out there for those of you like, that like the Twitterverse. I really like this one about Nationals policy around Pest Free New Zealand by 2030, 2040. So what do governments do that are worried about the coming election and um, what people might be thinking about water quality? Well, of course, they commission a report, as government bureaucracy tends to do. So uh, in some ways, we've been very lucky in the last couple of months in that there have been three reports published, essentially on exactly the same data. Um, the first one was released by the New Zealand government scientist, um, Professor Gluckman. Uh, in his summary, he concluded that water quality in New Zealand is declining and that it's declining as a result of urban development, hydroelectric development and intensification of agriculture. 
However, if you actually read the reports, um, you can see that the predominant cause of the decline in water quality in New Zealand is agricultural intensification. We have a, a few streams in New Zealand which are badly affected in urban areas. We do have a few hydroelectric dams, but really when it comes down to it, agricultural intensification is what's causing it. But that's not the message that he portrayed. The report in the middle is from the OECD, so in 2007 I think it is, they released a report suggesting that our preoccupation with uh, milk solids was bad and that it would lead to some adverse effects on both our environment and our economy. Um, they released a report again this year saying, uh, not surprisingly, exactly the same thing, that if we continued with our preoccupation with milk solids, that our economy would suffer and so would our environment. The final one is, uh, again, using exactly the same data, and in fact the data crunching behind it is done by exactly the same people in Niwa. This is put out by the Ministry for the Environment and the Department of Statistics New Zealand. Again, concluding, not surprisingly, that water quality in New Zealand is declining, that we are having a dramatically high increases in the amount of nitrate in our waterways. But she consciously made an effort on television to say that she couldn't actually conclude from all the data that they collected that why those nitrate levels were increasing. <laughs> I find that, yeah, surprising because really at the end of the day there's only one thing leading to an increase in nitrates in New Zealand and that's all of the urine coming out of the backs of all of those cows. So I'm not sure how much more e uh, evidence she needs to actually conclude that, but clearly far more than uh, she's got already. Not to mention that there's been 20 odd years of science done throughout New Zealand, including the last one there, that again was only published earlier this year, um, highlighting, not surprisingly, that water quality in New Zealand is declining, and not too surprisingly, that water quality in New Zealand is declining as a result of agricultural intensification, and in fact, as a result of dairy intensification. Um, so, although we've had three reports in the last few months saying exactly the same thing, we have had 20 odd years of science saying that same thing. So not surprisingly, in response uh, to a lot of public outcry, uh, the government has not sat around uh, twiddling its thumbs. Um, as a result of a, a, a weakish kind of director from the Land and Water Forum, Nick Smith eventually got on to getting the Ministry for the Environment to put forward a national policy statement on freshwater management. MFE had been promising to release this, or do one of these for years and years. In 2014 they eventually released one, and it's currently up for review. Um, it's called the Clean Water Reforms of 2017, it's basically an update of the 2014 version. I've got a different name for it, um, I think it's just as dirty as before uh, water reforms of 2017. Um, I guess uh, I have been a bit of a critic of that uh, national policy statement of fresh water from the perspective of science. So for that national policy statement of fresh water, the Ministry for the Environment collected together 60 scientists from without, within New Zealand to look at how best to manage ecosystem health. So what I've done is kind of summarise all the things which are important in general for understanding the ecosystem health of rivers. So I'm not going to deal with lakes, that is dealt with a little bit better in the National Policy Statement. I'm more concerned about rivers. And so any river ecologist that you would talk to in New Zealand or in fact in the world would say that if you want to look after the ecosystem health of rivers, you need to understand the plants growing it, in it, so the macrophytes and the periphyton. You need to understand the little creepy crawlies, the macroinvertebrates and the fish, and uh, globally there's a number of mammals as well, we don't really have any in New Zealand. To understand how to best manage those, you need things like water. Turns out that uh, in rivers you actually need a reasonable amount of water in them that haven't functioned properly. And in New Zealand, in fact, we need a reasonable number of floods to make our rivers function properly. You also need to not have too many nutrients in the waterways. Um, there's certainly a lot of publicity around that. But you also need to have good habitat quality, you need to have low levels of heavy metals, you have to have low levels of deposited fine sediments, and you obviously don't want to have too many sp uh, pest species like Didymo or Koi Carp floating around. So this is just kind of a general schematic. There are other things which on rare occasions are important, but if you wanted to manage the ecosystem health, which is what they talk about in the National Policy Statement of Freshwater, 
These are the things that you'd have to measure, you'd have to put them in, they call them attributes in the national policy statement, things that you have to manage for to make sure they don't get bad so that you can actually have a nice healthy river. This is what's actually in the national policy statement of fresh water in both 2014 and 2017. Ecosystem health is, measured, is mentioned, that's what they're trying to achieve. They're only measuring it in one way, so periphyton, and they're only looking at one variable that can affect that, and that's nitrate, and it's only nitrate at toxicity levels, which doesn't actually affect periphyton at all. It's only when it gets to very high levels that it can be toxic for fish, dogs, etc. They include ammonia and they include dissolved oxygen, which are very really important, so maybe downstream of the odd surge discharge, but in general, these are the only parameters they have in that management document to protect the ecosystem health for our fresh waters. So just remember, this is what it should have, and this is really basic, this is what it does have. The thing that's got the most publicity in the recent version of, uh, let's just have as dirty waters as before, has been the E. coli level, so Nick Smith and his Colleagues at the Ministry for the Environment said that they were redoing the, the limits for bacteria that make up whether or not you can go and swim in a waterway. And I was asked by a lot of media, radio and television um, what I thought of these new <coughs> guidelines and I said I didn't have a clue, I didn't understand them. I said I do have a PhD in freshwater ecology but to be honest I don't understand them. And as far as I can see I don't think there are any other scientists in New Zealand that actually understood them at any rate. So for a start to have guidelines that not even the scientists understand, to me, seems a very hard sell to say this is what we're going to put in place to try and manage our waterways. We really wanted to know whether he'd changed the goalposts or not, and as I said, nobody could actually figure out how. And so what they did is they sent it back to the guy that came up with those E. coli levels and said, can you please analyse all the data from New Zealand and tell us whether or not these goalposts are better or worse? And so this is the report that's really just come out, and the two key lines to look at are the 2014 guidelines. So according to these, depending on which rivers you looked at, somewhere between about 30 and 43% of New Zealand rivers would be swimmable, so it would be safe to go and swim in them. This is the Clean Water 2017, and so now somewhere between 43 and 62% of our rivers are swimmable. Nothing's changed. All that's changed is how they define what's swimmable or not, okay? So, did he move the goalpost? Yes, he sure did. And he made them a lot easier to be classified as being swimmable. So, you can see how he's going to achieve that 90% uh, of New Zealand rivers swimmable by 2040. He just keeps docking down the, the swimmable category lower and lower until eventually um, any septic pond is going to be classified as swimmable. <laughs> the other thing, and this, this is the issue which um, has been in both the 2014 and 2017 version is how they go about looking after those important attributes. So this is the map that I showed you before. So red is the high nitrate levels. These are the ANZAC guidelines. So anything above that is des described as being polluted according to guidelines put forward by Australia and New Zealand. On the right is a map of New Zealand Using the National Policy Statement fresh water categories, they are A, B, C and D. A, A is pristine, A is really good, and you can see heaps in New Zealand is really good. D is the purple one, so these are below the environmental bottom line, and that means that the regional councils have to go and do something about it. We can't have really polluted rivers. Luckily, there are, I'm not sure if you can make it out, but in fact there are only about two or three which actually meet that category. Some of the worst rivers that I've sampled in the Manawatu Wanganui downstream of some very poor surge discharges actually rate a B category, so that means they're okay. Um, I wouldn't certainly classify them as being okay. Why have we got such a problem in New Zealand? Well, uh, really at the end of the day, in 2017, it's a result of one kind of animal, and in fact it's a result of what's coming out of that one kind of animal. We have far too many dairy cows on our land, and they have far too much urine coming out of them, which is far too high in nitrate levels. And 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I would give these talks and say, well, you know, it's, it's partly an urban issue, uh, it's partly an agricultural issue, but these days, I, I just can't escape the facts that at the end of the day, it's a result of this. 
Between 1990 and 2012, uh, in response to the, the price that people were getting for milk powder, um, the, herd, the dairy herd in New Zealand has increased by um, nearly doubled, so from 3.4 to 6.5 million cows. Lots of sheep farms have been converted into dairy farms, and even the really marginal sheep farms now graze cattle, uh, dairy cows over the winter time as runoff feed. Each one of those cows produces the equivalent waste of about 14 humans. So those 6.5 cows uh, equal the equivalent waste of, where's my mouse, of about 90 million humans. That's the population of the Philippines. However, the difference is that that waste <coughs> from 90 million human equivalents is not going through a sewage treatment plant at all. It's going straight onto the paddocks, and unfortunately, because that urine is coming out in a very concentrated little area on the grass, most of it actually filters down into the groundwater and gets into the streams. If the farmers could actually distribute that urine out in the paddocks, it would be better for the grass, the grass would grow better, they'd need to put less fertiliser on, and a lot less of it would get down into the groundwater. But nobody's actually managed to figure out how to get that little urine to fly out when it comes out at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> and despite the fact that uh, Dairy NZ has said that we should decrease the number of dairy cows in New Zealand by a third, and even Nathan Guy, um, in one of his weaker moments, I suspect, has said we have too many dairy cows in New Zealand. Um, in the budget last week, they announced $90 million more for irrigation expansion. Now, if you read the rhetoric around it, it says it's for sheep and beef and blah, blah, blah. But really, the only industry in New Zealand at the moment that can afford irrigation is the dairy industry. So I can't see how it doesn't mean anything but expanding the dairy industry. Um, it certainly doesn't send many strong messages in my mind to anybody in the industry that we should be slowing down on how many cows we have. And it just it really surprises me. I was up in the Bay of Pinta the other day, and already there they're talking about a guy a company who bought a new dairy farm and they wanted to increase the herd density by double. Um, so even though we've got the Ministry for Agriculture, the main dairy research institute saying we have too many cows, farmers, not surprisingly, are still wanting to intensify so that they can create, in essence, more money. Not only do um, cows produce a lot of urine, they produce a lot of poo as well. And this is increasingly coming to the fore with a lot of the pathogens that are starting to get into our waterways. And although the issue in Havelock North was not related to cows itself, um, as I said to um, John Campbell, I really think it's only a matter of time before uh, pathogens from cows get to be an issue in many waterways around New Zealand. And, and most towns are now talking of putting chlorine into their water sources, whether it comes from a pristine spring or not. So each one of those cows defecates 12 times a day. It drops about 2.5 kilograms each time. So that's 25 kilograms of waste. You multiply that by 6.5 million, and that's quite a lot of poo. And as I said, that's untreated poo going onto the land. It's not going through a sewage treatment plant. It's not going through a sewage treatment plant that has to jump through a hole of the hoops to get a resource consent to prove that the discharge from that sewage discharge is not going to have any adverse effect on the waterways. So how can that not be affecting the land, not be affecting our waterways, and inevitably, um, I think, eventually affecting our health as well. Townies do have an effect. So as I said when I first started giving these talks, um, I really did think that it was equally a problem with towns as it was with agriculture. Uh, this is some research that I did way back in 2004 little town not far from where I live in Fielding, this is the Arua River, and you can see quite clearly the higher the bar, the bigger the ecological health, and in a very short distance, directly downstream from where the discharge from Fielding Township goes in, you can see that the ecological health declines quite significantly. So I'm not saying that um, urban streams are pristine or perfect, I've been told that many of the streams in Auckland are basically raw sewage running through them, Clearly little streams like the Arua and the hometown Tutanui stream are heavily affected by sewage discharges. But put it in perspective, one cow is the same waste as 14 humans. So a town city like Whanganui of 42,000 according to Google, that's roughly the equivalent of 3,000 cows. 
So what's that? Maybe 30 herds. Um, it could even be the size of one big herd. Um, and only last week, well, earlier this week, Nick Smith was saying, well, we don't want to have a divide between urban and rural. We can't be blaming the farmers for all of the pollution in our waterways. We need to say that it's equally the fault of, of urban streams. Yes, there are some urban streams which are an issue, but they only make up 1% of the stream length in New Zealand. And when you compare it to the amount of waste coming out of cows on the land, it seems to me that really, okay, and a few streams and rivers, the urban impacts are bad, but in the scheme of things in New Zealand, the overall impacts from dairy cows is far worse. So this is where I try and be a little bit more positive. Um, there are two main drivers of declining health in New Zealand rivers. Um, again, there are lots of other things which in a few instances can be important, but at the end of the day, there are two main things which are the problem. There are too many nutrients, so there are two nutrients which are bad, nitrogen and phosphorus, and I'll talk about the difference in those a little bit more in a minute. But the problem with them is that they cause the, the plant material in the streams, the periphyton, to grow too much. What that does is it sucks, sucks all the oxygen out of the waterway, it changes the acidity of the water, it changes the invertebrates that can feed on it, and that in turn changes the kinds of fish which can live there. So in essence it creates a, we call it a trophic cascade, the whole food web of the river changes when you put nutrients in as a result of too much of that algae growing. That's the thing that gets all the bad publicity, you have read about that in the news all the time. However, the addition of fine sediment is equally bad for the ecological health of waterways and certainly in the Wanganui area where you have a lot of soft mudstone, then sediment and erosion of sediment into our waterways is equally bad for the ecological health of the rivers and streams. The problem is that it gets in amongst all the spaces in between the stones. That's where all the invertebrates live, and in fact that's where all the fish live as well. And the fish can actually burrow down upwards of a metre or two metres in amongst all the little gaps between those stones, and that's usually where they hibernate during winter time. But if it's filled up with all that fine sediment, they can't get there, there's nowhere for them to live. There's nowhere for the invertebrates to live. And if they were able to manage to eat the algae which is on the tops of those stones, it's going to be filled with sediment. So it's a bit like you having a dinner at night, having it filled with sand. You can imagine, not only is it not very nice to eat, it's not very nutritious either. So those are the two big issues which are plaguing uh, the rivers of New Zealand. I don't believe that local government or national government is ever going to do much about our waterways. And I think what I'm starting to do now is try and advocate for citizens to take um, responsibility for their own hour, for their own river. Um, even if regional councils did care and did manage to put in place all of the laws that would uh, enaction things sensibly, there's no way they can look after all the rivers and streams that we have in New Zealand. And so I think really at the end of the day, it's up to us. If we really do care about our rivers and streams, it's up to us to do something about it. Maybe that is changing the government, I'm not sure, but certainly we can go and look at our local river and stream and figure out what's wrong and then start to explore what we can do about it. And I, I really, I get quite annoyed that um, lots and lots of people get up and say I'm a freshwater ecologist and this is what the problem is and this is how to solve it. And I've been doing research on freshwater ecology for 30 years and I still don't really understand it and I think how can these people know that with only having done one course at Massey University? Well, done it at Massey, they probably learned a lot, but, <laughs> <laughs> but then I re remind myself that actually at the end of the day it isn't rocket science, it's not neuroscience. Um, working out what the issue is is actually very, very simple. Um, there are lots of people at the moment that are proposing all these magic wands that can record all the water quality and somehow magically clean up things. You don't need an expensive wand, you don't even need a, a cheap measure. All you need to do is go to your river, pick up a stone and have a look at the invertebrates which are there. If the invertebrates are these guys, so if they're creepy crawly swimming around, that means you've got a good stream, the health is good. If they're all kind of slimy, wiggly things, maybe a few snails, they are technically called bad, I think that's really unjust to call them bad, it's not their fault, they can live in really degraded conditions. But what they're saying is that the health of that system is bad. So from looking at the bugs, which cost nothing, and almost anyone can do, so creepy crawlies versus slimy wiggly, you can see is it a good stream or a bad stream, okay? So now you know whether there's a problem. 
then there's only two things that it's likely to be. One is it's likely to be too many nutrients, which is causing too much algae. The easiest way to test that is to pick up a stone from your stream, preferably during summer, so that if you've just had a big flood, a lot of the algae gets scoured away. But if you pick up a stone during summer, you run your thumb over the top of that stone. If algae builds up on the thumb, you've got too much algae, okay? So the issue is nutrients coming into your stream. And if you're a farmer, you can maybe think to yourself, well, maybe I shouldn't discharge into that waterway, or if you've got, you know, your neighbour's a farmer upstream, maybe you can talk to them about increasing the riparian zone or doing something or shading your stream. But you can fairly quickly work out whether it's due to nutrients, changing the whole food base. The alternative problem that it might be is too much sediment. So the really uh, complicated test that you do here is called a shuffle test. You get in your stream and you shuffle around, and if it goes all murky, uh, there's too much sediment, okay? And if there's too much sediment, again, that's likely to be coming from upstream. Maybe it's a, a four-wheel drive track that's through the stream. Maybe there's a big slip or an erosion event upstream that, you know, maybe it's on your land and you can do something about it, or the local council is um, responsible for that. Uh, you can relatively quickly figure out what it is. Um, of course, then the, the how, how you do something about it is perhaps more challenging. But I think really at the end of the day, we can't rely on government to look after our waterways. We have to look after them ourselves. And if we, if we just sit back and we take our iPhones and we take a picture of the decline in the ecological health of our waterways, they are just going to continue to decline. And it's not until people are willing to get out there and take some initiative themselves, if they really do care about their rivers, that we can do anything about it. And, you know, despite the fact that I think you should go to university and do a degree to figure out how to do it, uh, you really don't need to because it's pretty simple. Uh, if you want to get more intense, you can also, there are lots of self-monitoring things. This is one that we developed uh, specifically for farmers to use. It's free if you do want a copy, just flick me an email and I'll send you a PDF and you can print it out. You basically just go through, tick a couple of boxes for each of the different categories and then add up the scores. The scores come between somewhere between 0 and 400. If your score for your stream is 3 to 400, then it's a pretty good stream and you can relax and enjoy your, the, the great condition of your waterway. If it's 0 to 100, then there's a lot wrong with your stream. You can actually look back through the form and see what things are, are scoring particularly low. And again, if you are so inclined, you might want to do something about those particular things. So it identifies what's wrong and then gives you the option, if you want to, to uh, do something about it. Um, really, at the end of the day, in terms of the scientific um, solutions to these problems, we really have got all of those. We have been doing research in this area, as I said, for 20 odd years. We do know exactly what's causing the issues. And in fact, we really do know what to do about them. The issue is not the science of what to do, it's the social and cultural ways that we go about trying to get that to happen because people don't really want to hear an inconvenient truth. Sediment, phosphorus and pathogens can easily be prevented from getting into your waterways by planting up or at least fencing off the riparian zones. I don't necessarily believe it has to be planted up in native bush, but if you do, great. To me, the key thing is that you fence it off and that you keep your cows on the other side of the fence. I quite often see waterways which are fenced off, but nobody's told the cows and they're actually on the wet side of the fence, particularly when the feed is getting low in the rest of the farm. Um, also, you need to have a, a reasonable riparian strip. So this is pretty marginal. It needs to be at least one metre. Um, there's a, a kind of a, you get the biggest bang for your buck in that first one metre, so about 80% of the sediment and phosphorus and pathogens are taken out in that first metre. If you're really concerned about the ecological health, then five metres, and if you really want to do a proper job, then 20 to 30 metres. But putting the fence right alongside the stream, yes, you stop, stop getting in there, and stock cows in particular really do like to defecate in the streams. It really isn't achieving what you want to do. And for the uh, dairy industry to say that 97% of their streams are fenced off, um, yeah, I guess that's kind of good, but some of the fencing that I've seen is pretty much putting the fence right next to the stream, and so you pretty much might as well not have even bothered. 
Phosphorus is running across the top of the soil, so those riparian plantings stop a lot of the phosphorus sediment and pathogens from getting into the waterways. And so that's why farmers have been fencing off their streams to stop phosphorus getting into them. However, uh, and, and phosphorus is declining in general in streams around New Zealand, however it doesn't stop nitrogen. So nitrogen goes straight down into the soil, it's very mobile, goes into the groundwater and it sneaks underneath that riparian zone. So it doesn't matter how wide your riparian strip or what you've got planted in it, it won't be stopping very much of that nitrogen getting into your waterway at all. And so, not surprisingly, nitrate levels in New Zealand are increasing because riparian planting will not stop it getting into the waterways. What we really need is smart farming. So um, I'm from a farming background, I'm not anti-farming, I know that it's important for our economy, but I get very frustrated with numerous people on the radio and TV saying, oh, we don't really know whether it's dairy farms and what about those urban things. At the end of the day, there's just so much science now that, that is, as far as I'm concerned, irrefutable proof that the decline in water quality in New Zealand in general, and there are a few exceptions, is a result of the intensification of the dairy industry. Much of the solutions lie in how we farm. <coughs> so there's been a lot of work by some of my colleagues like Alison Jews about how to manage that farm better, to have fewer stock on it, obviously having riparian strips which are appropriate. You don't have to lose out financially. She's shown that you can maximise your profits, you can maximise your enjoyment by only milking once a day, but also result in a much better outcome for water quality. So it's not this, you have to have the economy or the environment. You can quite easily have both together. It's just about doing it in a sensible way. And a lot of farmers are starting to do that but certainly the Fonterras and Dairy Research Institutes still seem to be promoting this increased productivity, increased productivity, mm -hmm. increased productivity, not how we're farming. And I can't help but think back to both the tobacco industry where um, initially they see the science was not, not correct, no way can lung cancer be caused by smoking, <laughs> then eventually the science catches up with the, the PR companies and the tobacco industry at the moment, uh, I think we're facing the same issue with climate change. Um, again, the science, again, from 99% of the climate scientists is pretty irrefutable. That climate is our, as a result of what we as humans have been doing to the planet. However, there are still uh, many people in many countries, many of whom you will have heard of, that are saying that, no, it's not due to that, it's uh, some conspiracy on the part of the Chinese. <laughs> and really, the dairy industry just seems to me to be exactly the same thing. Um, this, as I said, it's the scientific proof that the dairy industry, the dairy farming in high intensity, is causing the decline in our water quality is so clear cut, it's just not funny anymore. And why do they keep arguing that it's not an issue? Why don't we just face up to the fact that, yes, it is causing a decline in our waterways? And if, as New Zealand, we want to have that debate and say, well, we still want to have uh, you know, high export of milk powder to China and even though we're going to run out of profits from that in the 10 or 20 years according to the economists, if that's what we want to do, fair enough, but we cannot at the same time maintain our tourism industry, maintain our opportunities to swim in our waterways, maintain a lot of our indigenous fish and invertebrates. Um, I, I've always been brought up to believe that you cannot have your cake and eat it too, but I've read um, recently that the dairy Research Institute head to Mackle says, yes, we can have our cake and eat it too. I don't see how we can. It just doesn't seem to work. And um, as far as I can see, um, it's very short-sighted on the part of the politicians and on the part of uh, some dairy conglomerates. Um. However, again, we hear lots of discussion around all of the great thing that farmers are doing. And again, some farmers are doing some good stuff. But I think there's a lot more rhetoric than there is actuality. So again, yes, 97% of our dairy farm streams are fenced off, but if you've got your fence right next to your stream, well, you stop the stock getting in there, so you probably reduce the pollution by 10%, but you're still allowing 90% of it to pretty much go straight into that waterway. Those riparian strips have to be at least one metre, preferably five metres, and they have to be rank vegetation, not grazed vegeta vegetation. 
The farmers keep talking about the billions of dollars that they've spent um, doing all of these great things for the environment. Um, I sort of think about the, the uh, diet industry and the billions of dollars which are spent on fat diets and new ways to get thin. And if you take the, the argument that the dairy farmers have that they've spent billions of dollars looking after their waterways, they must be clean. Um, if we spend billions of dollars on the diet industry, that must mean that we're all thin as well. <laughs> it's not how much money you spend, it's what you spend the money on. And if they're spending money on planting up like this, then there's no way it's going to have any positive impact on the waterways. And then the, there's also the N-word. Um, it will not stop the nitrate getting into the waterways. And although the fencing has, I think, helped with the phosphorus issue, and to a lesser extent the sediment issue, it certainly is not stopping the nitrate getting into our waterways. And um, although it's a bit hard to say, it certainly does seem that nitrate is what's causing the decline in ecological health now. It's certainly increasing in our waterways. It is, when it gets to a certain level, toxic, but before it gets to that toxic level, it has adverse effects on the waterways and will eventually become toxic to us as well. So when it gets into water bores, it can cause blue baby syndrome, and it has been linked with a number of cancers as well. So again, although it's not directly linked with human health, the fact that it's leading to a decline in ecological health, to my way of thinking, is a sure indication that it's not that good for humans. Um, and again, there's lots of science. So I've been a member of the Land and Water Forum, which is supposedly a lot of the government industry and environment groups that get together down in Wellington every so often to talk through the issues around water management. And to me it always seemed strange that there were nitrate limits for lakes, but no nitrate limits for rivers. There were phosphorus limits for lakes, but none for rivers. So I took it upon myself to compile together some data, uh, not just my research, but lots of other NIWA uh, scientists and lots of reports. So I put together about 27 pieces of information put to, together into, uh, this is the same format that the National Policy Statement of Fresh Water has, for nitrate. So this would quite easily, there are nitrate limits available. They were circulated amongst the Land and Water Forum. Even Nick Smith knows about their existence. But is there any mention of the word nitrate in the 2017 report? No, even the CEO for the MFE won't actually say that too much nitrate is bad. Um, I've also gone one step further. I actually do a lot of artificial intelligence modelling with a lot of the data that I collect. So it's a bit like putting all of the data into the computer and getting it to figure out things for you. Many of you drive cars which have artificial intelligence that stop you crashing. You have your washing machines which have artificial intelligence and they stop you from putting, needing to figure out how much water to put in them or not. And so what you can actually do with these is to come up with nice decision support tools that allow you to look at what effects changes in land use might have. So down here at the bottom, this is the QMCI, so this is a, the invertebrate measure of whether you have a clean stream or a poor stream. And up here we've got land use, the amount of riparian vegetation and a lot of the nutrients in it. And so if we have, uh, what you can do is actually click on this and see what it predicts. So if we click on a, a stream in a catchment with low amounts of pasture in it, you can see that the chances of having a clean stream are pretty high, so about 62%, of moderately polluted stream about 16%, and poor about 22%. <coughs> so what happens when we move from a medium to high to very high stream? You can see that the chance of getting a clean stream, although it hasn't gone to zero, has actually declined quite significantly, but of course the chances of having a polluted or a moderately polluted stream has of course gone up. And you can explore all of these things in different rivers around the catchment and you can in fact then go and model out what the water quality would be for every river in your region. And so I've actually created this GIS layer that's available in Google Earth. And the good thing about that is that you can zoom into your local town and the red streams indicate that there's poor ecological health in your waterways. Orange indicates that it's average and green indicates that it's nice clean water. White is in fact where the, the model can't decide whether it's clean or, or polluted. And it probably doesn't come as any surprise to you that many of the waterways around your local town are, are less than pristine and that you really need to go 
fairly uh, far up into the, well, not, it's not that far, I guess, into the hinterland in order to uh, find some very nice pristine waterways. The, uh, the pattern around uh, Mount Egmont, Mount Taranaki is really striking, I think, in that um, clearly you can see the, the effects of the dairy industry and even in my hometown around the Manawatu and even over in the Rutanifan around Hawke's Bay and in some of the Wairapa regions around the Rutanifan. Have you got that for Auckland? No, no. It's got to sleep sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> But if anybody uses Google Earth and wants that layout, uh, it's a little bit big, but I can probably email it to you. I think it, it provides, as I say, it's all about giving the community the information to know what's good or bad in their stream. If you really want, I've got the published paper behind it that shows that the model is about 80% correct. So uh, it's not just me uh, dreaming up some crazy idea in my laboratory. Um, it's actually been validated. So, what do I think? Um, as I said, I'm, I'm quite pessimistic about things at the moment, partly as a result of being a teacher at this time of year, but also partly as a result of all of these reports. They keep coming out saying exactly the same thing, and they've been saying the same thing for, as far as I can see, about 10 years, and still nobody's willing to do anything about it. Um, I think, I, I find it a little bit strange that somehow the dairy industry has so much way over the government and the good guys in agriculture, the sheep and beef, uh, forestry, seem to be amazingly quiet. I don't understand why they don't put their hand up and say, hey, we're doing a really good job. Um, how come you're giving the dairy industry $90 million in subsidy in the budget and you're not giving us anything? Um, the first time I've really heard anybody was uh, somebody from the Forest Farmers Association this no, last week, I think, when the report came out about greenhouse gases saying, why is the government supporting the dairy industry when we can actually uh, forest a lot of our land, um, improve the water quality, improve our greenhouse gas emissions, and have a win-win? Um, and, yeah, why not? And why, why aren't sheep and beef saying, well, where's our subsidy for, um, you know, whatever we need to do to make our industry more profitable? Why is it that the dairy industry seems to have so much sway with the government despite it being counter to what everybody seems to say and what all of the evidence seems to say. As far as the industry goes, really, at the end of the day, um, even the dairy industry now is saying that we need to reduce cow densities. How they go about doing that when individual farmers, in many cases, still have it in their mind that the only way to make more money is to increase productivity. Um, as I said, there are some farmers, the smarter farmers, who have cottoned on to the fact that they can actually go to milking once a day, reduce the density of their herd, have a much better lifestyle, have a much smaller debt, probably have about roughly the same amount of milk production, certainly have more profit, um, and also create a better environment. Um, but it's very slow, and, and again, it really surprises me that why don't the dairy farmers want to make more profit uh, at the same time improving the environment when, as far as I can see as a simple ecologist, sitting in my ivory tower, it seems to be a very straightforward procedure. Why don't they do it? I don't know. Um, if they are going to continue, I think we need to have true accounting of the costs of dairy farming. All we hear about are how much profits they bring in from exports, but there's no record of how much we lose in tourism, how much we lose in swimming opportunities, how much we lose in fishing opportunities, not to mention the extinction of many of our iconic freshwater species. Fencing streams is certainly a good strategy for phosphorus and pathogens, but it certainly has to be at least one metre, preferably more. And we need to have serious environmental bottom lines. It's no good having this pretend document that almost all of the public seem to think is going to protect our waterways when in fact there's absolutely nothing, not one little shred of anything in that document which is going to protect anything. It is really just, I call it a licence to pollute. Uh, it really is. It's just going to allow things to get worse and worse. And somehow, I mean, they're clever. They have convinced a lot of the public that a national policy statement on freshwater management is going to help things. It isn't. It's got nothing in it. Um, I thought being a science meeting, I thought I'd also throw a few broad shots at science funding in New Zealand. Um, 
Again, we have these national science challenges, the land and water, the bioheritage. Um, I must admit, I'm not part of it. Supposedly, I'm not in the crowd. But to me, a lot of the research from the outside that they appear to be doing is really just rearranging the chairs on the Titanic. Mm. Nobody is sitting down to think why in the hell we launched the Titanic in the first place. Even at the Land and Water Forum now, almost all of the environmental groups have left because there's this continual rearrangement of the chairs on the Titanic without anybody actually getting down and doing the serious work of figuring out that actually I think we're on a boat and that boat is not doing very successfully. Um, and it's not just from an ecological perspective, it's from a cultural, social and I understand economic perspective as well. Classic example of this, this is the Selwyn River, Coes Ford. It's been in the media recently. Uh, everybody's all upset because that river's not got any water in it anymore and everybody used to be able to go and swim there. Um, I can't remember exactly now, but I think roughly six years ago, Niwa had probably five to six million dollars to study the Selwyn River. Okay, so in somewhere between 2000 and 2006, there were probably about 20 scientists working on the Selwyn River. They've got an enormous amount of science on the Selwyn River. Where is all that science? That river is pretty much stuffed, yet all of these scientists have been doing all of this research, funded by the government, to come up with what? There are some science solutions out there, so it's not all terrible. Um, certainly agriculture, um, lots of work going on on to what kind of plants we need to put in our pasture. Certainly a little bit of work slowly starting on which riparian plants would be best to try and take out particularly that nitrogen issue. Um, in the USA, uh, they, in the mid US, they have exactly the same issue that we have. Uh, lots of agriculture and lots of pollution in their waterways. They create these things called two-stage ditches, which kind of allow a bit of a floodplain on either side of the river. Floodplains are things New Zealanders hate to have. They need to get rid of those floodplains, particularly regional councils. But the floodplains serve a very useful role in that they denitrify that water. They take out a lot of that nitrogen. That's one of the best ways of taking the nitrogen out once you get it in there. Uh, people at Canterbury University are starting to look at bioreactors, so they're digging big holes next to the river filling it full of um, wood chips and then as the water goes through the groundwater through those wood chips again the bacteria and fungi in that do not try and take out a lot of those nitri nitrogen issues. So slowly there is a little bit of research going into what I would consider to be useful things but really it's pretty lo a, a long way off and we should have been doing this 10 years ago in my opinion. Um, I, I've kind of um, been a bit hard on the dairy industry. Um, it's not dairy farmers per se, it is the industry, it is the Fonterras and the Dairy Research Institutes and even the government. It surprises me because at the end of the day, the people that have most to lose are the dairy farmers. The clean green New Zealand is their economic advantage. That's why China wants our milk powder, not because it's nice and cheap, but because it comes from a country where they believe our environment is nice and clean. And it surprises me that the dairy industry isn't my biggest fan or Mike Joy's biggest fan because <laughs> it's their economic edge and they're letting it run down the river. Not only that, they're also shafting sheep and beef and forestry and manuka and etc, etc. You can only bluff for so long and increasingly the overseas media is learning that our clean green image is not quite what it appears to be in the tourism blurbs. And to me, again, I'm not an economist, but to me, it does not make any sense for us to be getting rid of our tourism industry or even getting rid of our economic edge that we have in terms of our agricultural industry at the expense of ridiculously increasing our number of cows with no foresight to what it's going to result in in the end. However, as a good boy scout, um, there's always pays to have plan B. So this is my plan B in a secret lab <laughs> up in the headwaters of the Pahonga Valley. Uh, we're plotting our revenge, just in case uh, all of the science and rhetoric and the careful thinking doesn't pan out. Thank you very much.